marijuana of today is not 20, 30 years ago. It is extremely addictive. I have uh, best friends who died from cocaine. I have best friends who died from alcohol and family. I have my closest best friend that died taking too much Vicodin. I don't have a single friend or person I know that died from marijuana. Why are we so concerned about marijuana? Tetrahydrocannabinol, tetrahydrocannabinol. It's still the same drug, literally. This is what you this sold to the public as would A better work. public policy than arresting people? Absolutely. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been insulted with that comment that uh, we're in some sort of industry to make money in this law enforcement profession. And it is insulting. Hundreds of thousands of people are arrested, arrested for possession. So shouldn't arrested. we, why don't we work together on getting people to stop smoking pot? And Americans can make these decisions for themselves. The views of normal have increased drug addicts, increased people driving high on our highways. There's only one way to get an addict, and that's if they're committing a crime. But if drug usage is not a crime, then you can't get that addict off the streets. I don't think that's a solution for everyone. Or it doesn't matter, it's what, you, it's what you told the voters. I completely disagree with that. Well, we live in two different universes of the reality. So today's segment and debate will be on the topic of marijuana. And today to my left, I have Paul Chabot with us, who is the current commander of Navy intelligence uh, for the reserve. And I know you also run your business as well, which hopefully you tell us a little about, about that. And then on my right, your left, we have Jen Michelle Padini, who is the development director for NORML, which stands for National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Did I say it right? Absolutely. We got it on the first try. So listen, first of all, thank you for coming out here Welcome. and yeah. being willing to talk about on this topic of debate. I know I, uh, on marijuana, I know a lot of folks are uh, uh, kind of going back and forth. Uh, why is there a debate? Why is there not a debate? Why haven't all states accepted it? Why are we even making it legal? Is it good for us? Is it not good for us? There's a lot of topics to go through. So prior to even getting into, one of the first things I'd like to do is it, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came about the current belief system that you have with marijuana. Why don't we start off with you first? Uh, so I was born and raised in Orlando, grew up in the 80s as a dare kid. You know, drugs are bad. Um, didn't really have any interest in public policy or marijuana. Spent the majority of my first career at Disney. Learned all about really? that. Mm -hmm. uh, moved to New York and worked in media came down to Northern Virginia area, DC suburbs, and uh, decided to become a mom. And before my daughter was one, I was dying from cancer. You, so, yeah, so that was- And how old were you at that time? When I was happened? 34 then. So at that time, Jen, had you yet uh, 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 had any experience with recreational marijuana or not yet? Yeah, I knew what it was, but okay. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't of any particular interest. Um, oh, so it wasn't something you were doing on a weekly basis, monthly basis, you weren't? No, and, and I'd, I'd heard of medical marijuana, but okay. this was 2005, 2000, or 2008, 2009. It was, some states had it, but it, it wasn't something that we had access to in Virginia. And, and sort of maybe you, you knew that someone might smoke a joint after chemo to help sure. them feel better. Sure. Uh, it wasn't where we are today, where we're having clinical and policy conversations mm -hmm. around it. Um, and then I, I went through 12 rounds of chemotherapy and they said, you're cured. And then six months later, they said, wait, you're not, you're dying now. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can try a stem cell transplant. That, that's your only possible cure. Otherwise, you can just prolong your life for a little bit with re radiation and chemo. Um, it's your choice. And, and so spoiler alert, I tried the transplant and uh, 10 years later, here I am. Unfortunately, the chemo that I needed for that transplant just causes more cancer. So I really became interested in how I might battle cancer a third time and what options were available around the country. That's how I came to learn about uh, the clinical use of cannabis for cancer. I met with physicians in other parts of the country that were already treating patients with that. I ultimately went to a legal seminar from Normal and met the founder there and, and told him about my personal experience. And he said, hey, you should go back to Virginia and work on public policy there. And, and so I did, I got involved at my state chapter of Normal and now I work for Normal and am hopeful that, like the work I've been able to do in Virginia where 
we have that medical freedom for doctors and patients to choose this option. Um, hopefully we'll have that in America one day too. And, and what effect did it have on you post when you started using it? Did you see, is cancer completely done? You're not, you're uh, cured from it, you have no issues. What results did you see yourself? Well, when I was going through yeah. chemotherapy in Virginia, we didn't have this option. Got it. So it became, uh, it became the idea that, well, if I am facing cancer a third time, I want to be sure that this is an option. Uh, for myself, mm -hmm. it was very selfishly motivated, and and, sure. and now it's an option for any patient uh, in my state, regardless of their condition. Uh, regardless some, of their condition, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not it's not yet legal for recreational, but right. it is for med, uh, medical use. It's regulated for medical use it in Virginia, like the majority of states around the sure. country. Sure, sure, okay, fair enough. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, how about yourself? Yeah, so uh, born and raised in Southern California. Um, my story is at the age of 12, I went through drug rehab uh, for marijuana, alcohol. Uh, today, I've got well over 30 plus years of sobriety going to NAAA, Marijuana Anonymous, working with uh, addicts across this country. At the age of 16, I became a law enforcement explorer scout going into the career field, became a deputy sheriff reserve out of San Bernardino County at the age of 21. Uh, retired out of there, last assignment was narcotics for 10 years. Uh, joined the Navy prior to 9-11, uh, 19 years in, tour in Iraq in, in 08, and uh, worked in the White House for two different directors of Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, served in Congress, State Department, Department of Justice, uh, founded Coalition Drug Free California, uh, ran for Congress twice, a Republican nominee each time, um, moved here to Texas after the 2016 election, started up a business called Conservative Move. I know your audience is largely business folks oriented. Mm -hmm. So we created a, a, an idea about helping to move families out of blue states to red states. And that company blew up overnight. We have about 250 agents across the country uh, as a national real estate uh, corporation. But as a side, uh, I'm very passionate about keeping kids off drugs. Um, I've seen what the legalization aspect has done uh, to our communities, looking at my home state of California. And here in Texas now, uh, founded Coalition for Drug Free Texas and still work on the national front on defeating uh, legalization of all drugs. So why don't we go back, you, you, you kind of went through it pretty quickly. You said at 12 years old, you went through drug rehab. Correct. And so what, what caused that to, 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 to happen? Yeah, so uh, you know, my parents got divorced when I was young and uh, not surprising uh, when you only have one parent in the household and they're working nonstop, just put food on the table. Uh, without a good parental influence, the community can become your influence. And so I began hanging out with a lot of people I should not have been uh, introduced um, you know, to drugs. At that time, it was alcohol and marijuana, and uh, went down that slippery slope pretty quick. Experimentation, social use, abuse into the addiction phase, and um, got it caught early enough uh, by my mom, who noticed, obviously, significant problems, getting taken home by the police, getting in fights at school, just a, going down that road at a young age and I went into a inpatient um, youth uh, drug treatment program about 20 other kids like myself in there for uh, various other types of addictions from marijuana to heroin and uh, it was probably the single most rewarding experience of my life um, having gone through that and so very passionate about it and still working with addicts today. so so what I love about today is both of you are true believers okay uh, your, you, you came to your conclusion not based on just reading articles, you came to your conclusion from life experiences, and also you came to your conclusion based on life experiences. And uh, the idea today is to try to see if there's any uh, blind spots on either side, if there's any areas that maybe we're not uh, seeing to get clarity for the viewer, whether they're on right, uh, to kind of say, I never thought about it this way, what on, they're on left, and say, hey, you know what, I never thought about it this way. So, first of all, uh, when you think about marijuana today, it is legal for recreational use, I believe in 11 states, if that's the number. 11 I think states it's 11 in the states. District of Columbia. In the District of Columbia, and in mm -hmm. 22 states is legal for medical, right? Uh, over three dozen U.S. states and territories are regulating medical marijuana now. Now, you know, how has this thing evolved from where it was at 10, 20 years ago to today? Why are we more receptive to it today than before? You know, I, I think that it's really access to information that's sped this process up as far as 
the reform of public policies and, and what, what policies people want to see at the, at the state and, and often federal level as well. It's, it's access to that information. You know, we aren't uh, subject to reading whatever is in the newspaper and be believing that is, is the gospel. That's kind of how we got to this point of, of prohibition anyhow with Reefer Madness back in the 30s. Uh, now people can tune into shows like yours. They can Google clinical articles on the internet and, and read the facts for themselves and make their own conclusions. And, and that's really helped uh, propel this movement forward is, is access to that information. So education, access, internet, social media has helped us kind of get our own opinions versus before uh, the media politicians, big money, big pharma maybe controlled it through lobbyists. Certainly, just like any issue, now people have access to that information at their fingertips. Got it. Okay. How, how about yourself? Yeah, I, I would disagree with that um, in the sense of that it's not accurate information. There's certainly a lot more information out there, but it's basically fake news. And it's controlled by very wealthy people. Um, George Soros, one of them, uh, the founder of uh, Men's Warehouse, the founder of Phoenix University, a number of years ago put in a lot of money to basically normalize or attempt to normalize drug use, starting off with medical marijuana. This is all about money. It's not about health. It's not about safety. But when we talk about people going to the internet, if you go and type in marijuana on the internet today, you're going to come up with a million hits on how great it is for you. And so yes, there's a lot more information out there but that information is completely one-sided. And it's because there's a huge effort. Uh, you just follow the money. Your, your folks at home are smart enough. You can go to the website Open Secrets and track political donations of where they come from and look at where Marijuana Policy Project, Normal, look at where others are putting their money and look how much money they have. You can absolutely change perception in a society when you have that much money behind you marketing anything at all. So, so to what though? What is the motivation of legalizing it for money? Are you saying, uh, is it like Big Pharma where last year they made 90, the top 10 Big Pharma last year made $90 billion in profits alone? What is the motivation of wanting to legalize it? So there's really two portions to this. There's really the, the, the George Soros vision of open society, uh, which, which is the belief that everything is on the table. Not just marijuana use, but overall all drug use prostitution, you name it. There's this radical ideology which is, which is part of it. But now there's a whole nother part where it's all about the money. Uh, and there is a ton of money to be made in marijuana. So when you see the push now, you have um, tobacco now getting into the marijuana movement. So but you have to ask yourself, is this about medical marijuana or marijuana legalization? Which is it? If you look at California right now where I came from, the, the first push was about medical marijuana. Then they went to marijuana legalization. Now they're going to legalize shrooms, basically a, a form of a hallucinogen. You have heroin injection sites in other areas. So this isn't about just marijuana. It's about outright overall drug legalization, let people do what they want to do. Is your, pause, your concern more the effects it has on people and possibly kids like yourself because yeah. you were 12 years old, 10 years old, right. going through a family. Is your concern more the effects side of it or is your concern more it being legal and being business? What is your biggest concern? It's the negative impact on kids and communities. I saw it in law enforcement for 21 years. My mother was a social worker. If you look at most kids today um, who are abused in adoption, they come from homes where their parents are using drugs. New research out yesterday showed a strict correlation between alcohol and marijuana use, commingling those substances and the impact on kids. Here's, here's the, the, the challenge, and a lot of business owners, God bless them all, have a more libertarian mindset, right? Just let people do what they want to do. But that's not, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world where we have kids and communities. If you look at areas like San Francisco, if you haven't been there, I encourage anybody just to Google the streets of San Francisco. You have a policy there, which is basically drug legalization, let people do what they want to do. You now have more homeless people on the streets than you do kids in their public schools. You've got poop all over, needles, um, they've decriminalized drugs, and even San Francisco people are saying, this is crazy. So when you go down that road of outright legalization, you create a Portland, a Seattle, a Los Angeles, a San Francisco. Mm. And that, I think, for the most part, is not what we want for our communities. What would you say to that? Well, I think that the concerns that Paul has about children accessing drugs, and in this context, we're going to talk solely about marijuana, 
I think that, that that's something that we all care about. And children shouldn't have access to alcohol or tobacco or marijuana. But when we as a state or as a nation turn our head and say, nope, we're, we're not going to legalize and regulate the adult use of marijuana, what we're effectively saying is we'd prefer to go ahead and continue allowing the illicit market who sold drugs to Paul to be the, quote, regulators of that industry. And that's not providing for public safety. That's not preventing youth use or access. The fortunate thing that we have now in America is we can look at years and years. We have over two decades of marijuana regulatory experience in America, and we can look at those data and the data that are coming out of states that have regulated not only medical, but in particular adult use marijuana, where we are seeing a nine point reduction in youth use. That's important because when you're taking marijuana off the street corner and putting it behind an age verified counter where adults can access it if they want, that's how you reduce illicit market and that is how you prevent youth access. It's also how you lab test and label products for consumer safety. So simply from a public policy standpoint, uh, prohibition isn't working. It's not preventing 12 year olds like Paul from getting marijuana. Uh, but we do have data from the states that are regulating marijuana and we are seeing that reduction. And that, that is what normal advocates for is precisely because of the potential harms. So legalize but regulate. Right. What does that look like? It looks like something different in every state right now because every state is implementing their own policies uh, in, in, the, in the inability of Congress to act, to, to take action and end federal prohibition. What, what is the most ideal state that you think is doing it right? You know, I don't think that there's any ideal state model, but yeah. um, uh, states that are regulating medical use and providing patients access to the types of products they need for whatever their disorders might be mm -hmm. as recommended by their clinicians. That's an important model. And then regulating adult use so that adult consumers can access it at a, at a clean, well-lit storefront that regulates and, and ID checks. That's important. Uh, we have different models and I don't think anyone is, is the perfect model yet. States have different models for alcohol regulation as well and, and what works in Texas might not be what works in California. Got it. So let me ask you, Jen, what is the limit? What is the limit on, like what you said right there, what other drugs should we be comfortable legalizing? For you, are you comfortable with everything becoming legal? Uh, you know, I, I, I can't speak for normal on that because normal is specific to marijuana. That's it. It's marijuana public policy. Um, personally, I'm aware of the model that Portugal has where they have decriminalized all drug use. Mm -hmm. And if a person uh, needs to or wants to use drugs, they get those drugs from a pharmacy where they also have access to health care. And um, that, that country has a very low incidence of drug use. So it is a model of harm reduction that's working. I think we'll see more and more of that. Um, and I don't think that, that decriminalizing drug use on the personal level is, is a blanket statement that says, hey, everyone, go out and do drugs. Uh, it's a harm reduction tool that's proven and works. And, you know, I, I think we can just let the data speak for themselves on that. You know what I watch? So uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle myself, just the, the way I'm registered. And, I, and I'm trying to get both arguments uh, to see what's going on. So, on the NRA side, it's like, well, you know, if you go after guns, you may go after this, you may go after your semi-automatic weapon, let's legalize this, let's legalize that. So it almost seems like one side of the argument is making sense, but only to the products that they support. And the other side of the argument makes sense, but only to the side that it makes sense. Hey, let's just start off where they, you know, you want to make guns, let's just say semi-automatic weapons illegal, or not yourself, but sometimes Democrats do. And the Republicans are saying no, and you're saying let's legalize, well, let's make uh, uh, ban marijuana and these drugs because if not, we can go deeper. So I sit out there from the outside. If I'm the viewer, I'm saying, okay, there is some of these philosophies that are libertarian independent because, like, look, let them do what they want to do. Guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? Marijuana doesn't kill people, or drugs don't kill people, people kill themselves by overusing whatever, maybe. What is your biggest concern yeah. outside of that where? hey, if we have guns that are legal that I can go get it, why not make uh, marijuana also legal for me to go get it? Yeah, great. Let me, let me get to a few of the points, um, and then I'd like to wrap that in for this. Um, look, we have 
uh, drug use exploding in states with marijuana. So the, the, the real data is that yes, youth are using. When you look at the, the compilation of data amongst youth in marijuana states, it's huge. The biggest lie that, and, and the biggest lie that voters were told is if you legalize marijuana, you're gonna do away with the black market. That's not happening. Uh, you can look at Colorado or California, Seattle, 80% plus of the marijuana on the market now is from the black market. The black market has exploded in those states. You've actually brought cartels now into the national forests, creating these grow houses of marijuana in neighborhoods. It's done the complete opposite. You used to have an effort where law enforcement could target cartels. Now you have this odd situation where you have is, is it medical marijuana or is it a marijuana outlet or sick people? You know, it, it's, it's confusing. And then you have the black market, which was never going to go away. They simply said, hey, great. You know, we now can get in this industry. They've undercut all those taxes and regulations and the safety mechanisms that they said they were going to do for marijuana. And you have now what you have in California, Colorado, Seattle, Washington, all these different areas. And I, I encourage, you know, you got a lot of smart folks who watch this show. Just look at the legitimate news sources out there about ongoing investigations into the black market in marijuana. And in fact, the marijuana industry today is saying, yeah, there's a huge problem with the black market in these states. What do we say on our side? Hey, you created that problem, you try to fix it, because we warned you all this was going to happen. Portugal is the poorest European country, um, and it's not a very good model or example to use. The other really critical point is, you know, we don't want to throw people in jail or prison for, you know, low-level offenders. Mm -hmm. And that's always been a legalization talking point. Let's legalize drugs, we'll empty our prisons, we don't need to have everybody in there smoking a joint. My 21 years in law enforcement never arrested somebody just for smoking a joint. You're going after the hardcore dealers. If you look at the crime stats, what's happening is most of those crimes are getting pled down. So the most important piece about this is we want to help people. You know, there's a difference between guns and drugs. Drugs are an intoxicant, which can become an addiction, especially at a young age. If we want to move the needle down on drug usage, we need to have a comprehensive approach. Education, prevention, treatment, enforcement, and recovery to make that problem smaller. Right now, we're not. We've opened Pandora's box. Drug usage, marijuana usage. You know, look at it this way. We, we can all agree we've got enough problems in society with alcohol and prescription drug abuse. Now we've added another intoxicant to that. If you believe that drunk driving is a problem, which we all do, how about drugged driving while high? In these states that have legalized marijuana, of course you got people who are driving high or from alcohol, but now you've got people who are driving high from pot, and yeah, they're also killing people just like the people who are driving high from alcohol. But Paul, what you're saying is then, then, then if that's true, then you also believe that we should, make, uh, we should ban alcohol. Here's my point on this, and I mention this all the time, is that we, are, we have enough problems with alcohol and prescription drug abuse, clearly, but that's part of our society today. I don't drink out of personal choice. Well, and what does I, that mean? It's, it's part of our society today. It, well, it is mainstream. You go to football games, tailgating, you've got commercials, you've got t-shirts, you've got NASCAR, Budweiser cars. It is part of the fabric of our entire society now. And a large chunk of people do use it. And by the way, Prohibition was actually started by a women's movement. They were tired of seeing their husbands coming home drunk. So it wasn't government pushing prohibition, it was local community people fed up seeing their drunk husbands coming home. Yeah, so the, 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 the thing I'm trying to find out on both sides of the aisle, there's a lot of contradictions. Because if you're saying, you know, your concern is George Soros, it's all about money, you know, let's uh, make sure we legalize this. But if you look at alcohol and beer, everything you said with sports, I watch a commercial for beer, I'm thinking if I have a Budweiser, I'm gonna go home with three women today because every commercial's like that. You see all these hot women at a bar, hey, drink a Budweiser, she's talking and she smiles, everybody's dancing. So that's also big business, right? So why are we okay with alcohol being legal, but we are not with marijuana being legal? And that's, and that's the argument that is being made to legalize drugs. Not just marijuana, you can make a lot of money off marijuana, and they are today. But you can also make a lot of money off methamphetamine, off heroin, off LSD. Yeah, but marijuana is a Schedule One drug with heroin in the same category as heroin, and cocaine is a Schedule Two drug. So, but alcohol, I can go buy 192 proof spirits, a drink from Poland, and drink it and kill myself, and absent, and I can get access to any of these things, and it's yeah. just as bad for you as it is 
and not just as bad. You know, studies have shown it's way worse for you than marijuana. So why are we so concerned about marijuana over alcohol? Well, would you be concerned about the new research showing a link between marijuana use and psychosis? Meaning, elaborate. Well, the research clearly shows, and I'm sure Normal will agree with the research now, that uh, heavy marijuana use has a strong linkage to psychosis. If you've ever dealt with somebody who's psychotic, it's probably one of the most depressing cases that you can deal with. The marijuana of today is not 20, 30 years ago, where it's 1 to 3 percent tetrahydrocannabinol. You look at the dabs, the vaping, the, the potency products, the gummy bears, the things that are marketed towards kids, pot tarts, and other things, it is extremely addictive. Not the same marijuana. And I encourage your, your, your viewers to watch the Attorney General um, YouTube him, talking about the marijuana of today, very different than the Cheech and Chong marijuana, of the marijuana that even I was smoking. We're dealing with something that is extremely potent and extremely dangerous. I'm not disagreeing with that. So my, my view isn't disagreeing with that. So I'm not endorsing let's legalize because it's good for you. I'm not endorsing that. What I'm saying is if you're saying marijuana should be banned and that's what you support because you know access shouldn't be out there to kids then you're also saying let's start off with marijuana and then we got to go to alcohol next nope not saying that. Be but why not alcohol is terrible and it's legal it is terrible and i think we need to use that <coughs> consistently as a reminder to society about why you don't legalize other drugs when i when i talk to college kids or high school kids or parent groups across this country the first question i always ask them how many of you know somebody who's died due to a substance abuse related incident. Almost all the hands go up in that audience because we all know somebody, you probably know somebody who's an Absolutely. addict. Absolutely, oh right? yeah. And if you think about this for a minute, did that person wake up and say, hey, tomorrow I wanna to be a heroin addict or a coke addict or a pot addict? No, they all started off with experimenting. We all start off that very first time. And when we normalize drugs, we, in, we encourage this behavior that it's okay to try. And when you look at the phases of addiction, remember, nobody anticipates or expects themselves to becoming addicts. But it's, it's the trying it out, the experimentation, social use, abuse, and addiction. We've got over seven million addicts on our streets today in America, and one of three things happens to an addict. And you know this having probably friends or, or family or anybody in the field, we all do. It's jails, institutions, or death. They, they get locked up, something happens, they commit a crime. You look at most property crime in San Francisco or these cities where they've basically decriminalized drugs. Now you have people breaking into cars consistently in San Francisco to support their drug habit by selling what they steal. So personal drug use creates an addict. And when you're an addict, it changes your mind. The only thing you're looking for consistently is that next high. And you're not going to hold a regular full-time job as an addict. You're going to commit crimes in your community. And so that is the totality of what we're dealing with. The libertarian view, God bless them, but we're not a perfect society, perfect-minded people where people can just smoke in their homes and shut the door. They enter into our communities, and that's where it becomes a problem. I'm going to come back to you with that, but I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what he just said. So a couple things. I think it's important that we... We can all have our own opinions, but I think data are really what we need to come back to. Um, states that have medical marijuana laws see a 25% reduction in opioid overdose fatalities in the first year. And around year three, year five, they're at the 35% reduction in opioid overdose fatalities. Just by having medical marijuana laws, not even access. That's an important, again, harm reduction tool that states can take advantage of. I'm proud that Virginia elected to take advantage of that as well. Um, the numbers don't lie. That's, that's not by coincidence. So there's one thing we can look at. It is important that we, we have alternatives out there to deal with the, the pain crises that Americans are experiencing today. Um, alcohol, right? Prohibition didn't work for alcohol. Prohibition's not working for marijuana. Clearly it didn't prevent Paul from having access as a kid. So why are we continuing this failed public policy? We didn't continue it with alcohol. We shouldn't be continuing it with marijuana. States that have legalized marijuana see a reduction in DUIs. You know, states that, that have states that legalize marijuana see a reduction in alcohol DUIs. In alcohol DUIs. Okay, yes. so let me ask you this: ideal situation, we legalize it. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, I can go buy it from store for recreation or for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do I regulate it? How do you treat that as alcohol? Is there a DUI? Is there 
How do you regulate it for it not to get out of control based on some of the regulations you're talking about? Well, driving while impaired, regardless of substance or reason, is illegal in every state, period. There's no... So that doesn't change because that's what it is today anyways. It doesn't change. Uh, People (laughs) are using marijuana in every state in the country, whether it's legal or not. People are driving impaired for a variety of reasons in every state, regardless of the fact that it is illegal. When whether a state has legalized marijuana or not, you have to be prepared for judging impairment. And our law enforcement officers are more than capable of doing that right now. They have no problem prosecuting uh, driving under the influence of drugs as it is. And there are even more improved tools to help uh, quantify whether or not someone is impaired aside from just this roadside sobriety test that might be executed. Those are important tools that not only law enforcement are adopting, but companies as well, and they're seeing a significant uh, reduction in, in, in costs associated with drug testing when you implement a software-based impairment uh, testing device. You can gauge for impairment regardless of reason, and then if you want to to continue into uh, asking for someone's Mm. bodily fluids to see why they're impaired, then you can take that next step. So adopting tools like that that are evidence-based, that are non-biased, are important, and they're in use around the country right now. Uh, Do you think also legalizing it? Because I know last year, and I want to come to you with this as well, last year I think we spent 91, our prison cost in U.S. last year was $91 billion dollars. We had 650,000 people that got arrested for marijuana in 2017, 650,000. 91% uh, was just simply on possession of marijuana. So 91% was possession of marijuana, and then the rest is just they got arrested for whether they're dealing or whatever they're mm-hmm. doing. Do you think also legalizing, and I know you had something to say about this, do you think also legalizing, it's going to allow some of those folks who are in there for recreational use to come out and not pick up other bad habits because sometimes somebody's smoking a joint they go in prison and then they're seeing other bad habits and then they're bringing it back out how do you think that's going to minimize is it going to minimize crime in america or is going to increase crime in america by releasing people from prison that are there for marijuana possession possession? yes you know i think that so taking marijuana off of the controlled federal controlled substances act is what will end the prohibition of marijuana at the federal level. Say that one more time. Taking? Taking, removing marijuana from the Controlled Substances sure. Act, where yeah. today, as you pointed out, it is a dangerous Schedule One narcotic like heroin. That's, that's what will end the federal prohibition of marijuana. That does not automatically open the jails and let everyone out. Uh, states will have to take those steps on their own, and the federal government would have to you know, include a provision like that if, if that's what it chose to do with legalizing marijuana at the federal level. Is that going to make America safer? It's going to reduce our prison population. It's going to let a lot of people hopefully go back to work. But when people are in prison, that's where they learn how to be even Worst criminals. What, what is your biggest concern? And I know you're pro, so I'm just curious, because sometimes when you're for something, it's kind of hard to have blind spots. What is the biggest concern for somebody like you that's pro-legalizing marijuana that's going to happen once we do? So what is our biggest concern we'll face if we do say marijuana is legal for recreational or anything else in America today? It's how how marijuana will be uh, legalized and regulated and what steps Uh, America will take to undo some of the harms that have been done by prohibition to communities that are most impacted by marijuana prohibition. Are we going to direct those tax benefits to those communities to to build better schools, to provide better um, prevention education so that kids don't seek out drugs? Um, what are we going to do to help build up these communities that we have devastated with marijuana prohibition? I think that's a real concern, um, not just for advocacy groups around the issue, but for industry groups as well. So access to kids, teenagers specifically, you're not concerned about ac- access to kids, teenagers changing whether we legalize or we keep it the way it is? Or do you think access is going to get easier? I think, based on the data, coming out of states that are Mm -hmm. currently regulating the adult use of marijuana. What we are seeing time and time again is that youth use is not increasing. Youth use is decreasing. I think that's something that's that's important to embrace. And drug dealers are not shy about selling drugs to kids, and that includes marijuana. But don't don't you think like a drug, let's just say I'm a drug dealer, okay, and I sell pot. 
-hmm. And every month I'm selling to 10 year old Paul, and okay man, here you go, here's the dime bag. And I just keep selling, right? Mm -hmm. I'm making money and then all of a sudden America legalizes marijuana. And I go to Paul and I say, Paul, listen, man, you think marijuana was good? You gotta try this Coke. You didn't wait for America to legalize marijuana if you're a drug dealer to sell Paul the next thing. Well, what I'm saying is I would adjust. So I'm gonna go to my next product that I can sell illegally to make money, right? So I would go and say, hey, you know, I have this. Then you say, so I'm gonna go to the next level because I gotta figure out a way to illegally to make money so I don't have to pay tax and I keep the cash. And this is an easy way. So don't you think even legalizing, it's gonna make because one of the things about drug dealers, they're brilliant entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They're very creative. So you're not, you're not seen a like, okay, you legalize it, no problem. Coke pays me more profits. I'll go and create this habit for kids. Sir, I'm not going to advocate <clears throat> for a public policy of prohibition that ruins millions of lives every year just because of how a drug dealer might make their next dollar. No, no. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that I'm not even asking that. What I'm asking is if you're saying, like, if your position is like, just like I pushed them on the fact that if you're so concerned about marijuana, why are you not concerned about alcohol, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, he was kind of, you know, well, it's the American lifestyle. I didn't really, you know, I didn't get a clear answer on the mm -hmm. part with alcohol because alcohol last year, 4,700 teens died from alcohol last year. From, that's teens. We're not talking adults. That's a lot of numbers. Yeah. We don't have that many teens dying from smoking pot. What I'm asking you is, if we legalize marijuana, why not, based on your uh, opinions, legalize everything else? I think the argument has been made for that harm reduction model already. So of, you support of, that? I think that it's a not normal. View. I think it's a valid a valid tool. I don't know that it's the right tool today for America, but I think that it, it is likely a sounder public policy. Regulation in general is a sounder public policy than allowing the illicit market to be the quote regulators. It doesn't provide for public safety or consumer safety. Why, why do you think it's not proper today? Is it too extreme today where the populace may not be ready for it and we have to oh, kind of go through transitions? Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that's where Americans are today. I know that they're there for marijuana. Over 62% 60, are mm -hmm. comfortable yep, legalizing. I, but absolutely. I, but again, I, uh, I'm asking the question of if we legalize this, the drug dealers are not going away because there's a lot of nice mm -hmm. illegal drugs to still make money on. So if you are for that, you're saying we're not ready today. Why are we not ready today? If we're going to campaign for this, why? It's up to Americans. I mean, so you're leaving it to Americans. But to you, you're comfortable if we legalize everything. I mean, I think it's a better public policy than, than letting illicit market so control So yes it. to cocaine being legal? Regulated for, for, a, sure. for access, sure. I think, it's, I, think, I think personal drug use should be decriminalized. And I think if people have a substance abuse issue, they should be able to access that substance and treatment in the same facility free from stigma so that they can get the help they need. So, you know, I'm a math guy. So when I say math, okay, so we legalize uh, cost for prison goes on for 91 billion to another place, to, to another number, right? Uh, but also at the same time, every year we spend $190 billion for alcohol. Like it's costing American a lot of money for alcohol that we're dealing with, whether it's kids, whether it's all these other issues that we have. Do you think the numbers are gonna even out or Sometimes when I take money, I run a business, I take a million dollars from this department and I put in another department, this department looks good, but then all of a sudden we have a massive issue on a whole different side. Do you think that issue from prison is going to go to a different place? What do you think? There's a lot of misinformation that just came out that I'd like to address real quick. Please. So less than one half of 1% of people are actually in prison for, for marijuana possession. Remember, most folks who get arrested are these high level people that are then pleading down. So. We're not, our prisons are not filled with low-level pot offenders. That's just not, not the case. Um, yes, drug use is absolutely up with marijuana use in states that have legalized marijuana. That, those, those are relevant stats that are out there. Second, um, with the opiate use, um, new research out just this month shows, no, that actually um, in states that have legalized marijuana, opiate use is huge now. So um, the research is clear. And 10 years ago, if we had this debate, there's a lot of theories back and forth. We have real world examples now about what legalization looks like. Uh, great documentary done out there by a news team in uh, Seattle. Documentary is called Seattle is Dying. What they did is they went throughout the city and basically looked at a community that has the vision of what my opponent is advocating, which is let people do what they want, decriminalize. And what you have there is a disaster. The documentary is scary because if the, the, the radical side of America that wants to legalize drugs, starting on the benchmark of medical marijuana, marijuana, outright legalization, all of our cities across America are going to begin to look like that. 
What's interesting about Seattle is when you see the problems with crime, the police hands off, they don't do anything. You got people literally shooting up in the street, just laying there dying. You have the business owners, and you're a business owner. Business owners who might have been ambivalent to this when it was first on the ballot now are saying, I can't operate my business here. I am moving my business to another city outside of Seattle. In LA, where you have a explosion of homelessness, remember, most of these people are addicted to drugs. So what is it to, the legal, to my legalization friends? Are we gonna decriminalize drugs? If you do, then you're gonna end up with that kind of a society, and, but you're not gonna arrest them because you don't wanna fill our jails with a billion dollar, right? So what do you do? We don't have to theorize anymore. It's already happening in America, mm -hmm. and we know that that's a dangerous model. So, so the idea of uh, legalizing everything you're not comfortable with? No, absolutely not. I, I'll go back to this with the alcohol thing. And, and prohibition, it's really critical that folks really understand prohibition. Prohibition did not ban all alcohol. You could still have beer. It was the hard alcohol. So the argument about prohibition, and they'll say, well, it created Al Capone. No, it didn't. Al Capone existed long before prohibition, and the ideology has existed long after it. There's about 10 talking points that the legalization side puts out there mainstream that are factually just incorrect. And I, I believe this, that when the American public fairly hears both sides of the argument, they're gonna make the right decision. But the reason these states are going to legalize, like in California in 2016, mm -hmm. we defeated it in 2010 and 2014. But you know, we're moms and dads, we don't have a lot of money. The marijuana folks have millions of dollars to come in. And who that's, are the marijuana folks? Outside of Soros, who are the marijuana folks that you're talking about? Oh my gosh, today it's, it's everybody. It, you've got um, Altria, which is part of the tobacco industry, which is now investing in marijuana. Uh, so big pharma's going that direction oh, saying, well, I'm gonna be able to tax it and it, make money it, on it's it. All about, it's all about the money. It has never been about healthcare. It's never been about the good. It, there's a self, the unfortunate part about being humans is there is a selfish nature to us. And unless we have a strong ethical moral code, we go to the dark side every time. And that's what's happening with drugs in society. And we see it playing out today. Paul, I have uh, best friends who died from cocaine. Yeah. I have best friends who died from alcohol and family. Uh, my uncle was in prison in Iran for selling alcohol because it was illegal to sell alcohol in Iran. I have best friends that have died from uh, uh, oxycodone. I have my closest best friend that died from Vicodin. Uh, taking too much Vicodin. I don't have a single friend or person I know that died from marijuana. Why are we so concerned about marijuana? Uh, well, because marijuana is extremely dangerous. The THC tetrahydrocannabinol, if, 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 if we're only gonna say you have to die from something for it to be bad, then that is a difficult place to have a, a conversation from. We know that, that marijuana in itself is an intoxicant, extremely addictive, and the link now to psychosis, to secular cancer, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, you name it, that many people who end up using the harder drugs often start off with these basic drugs. And, and marijuana users are not solely marijuana users. They are poly drug users. So it's not just marijuana. We look at the new research out just yesterday that showed 90% huge numbers of those who are using marijuana and alcohol are very abusive to their children in homes. You look at children that are found in homes where they are sexually abused, violently abused, most of their parents have an addiction substance in them. When you look at most criminals who go to prison, not arrested for drugs, but a, uh, arrested for battery, spousal abuse, a property crime, have drugs in their system. Drugs are the cornerstone of most problems that we have in our society, and legalizing, legitimizing them only further increases that risk. It's sad that you and I both know people that have died from these drugs. I've got a cousin who died from heroin. I've got family members across the board, alcohol issues. I've seen it time and time again. The problem is this, Hollywood, mainstream, TV, radio, film, they glamorize drug use. We have no more education prevention talking about the dangers out there. Instead, it's let's normalize it, let's decriminalize it, and that is to me a sin. But Paul, uh, you, you're a data guy. You've been saying all these data. How many people have died from using marijuana? Well, they just had one that a coroner put out last month. 39-year-old lady? The, yeah. The, okay. Yeah. Outside of that, that's one though. 5.5 five well, million have died from cigarettes. Like, but, like I give you that for me with cigarettes. Cigarettes are really killing, like this is really killing yeah. people. Yeah. But cigarette tobacco is not an intoxicant. So marijuana is. 
But marijuana driving, look, I, a CHP officer in California killed by a guy driving high on pot, killed him. Uh, you have a lot of these incidences where people have died. That as, story would be in millions with, with uh, hundreds of thousands yeah. with alcohol, though. Well, well, right. So I think that, you know, do we have to get there to say that this is bad? Or do we, or do we simply Are you pro-gun or anti-gun? Pro-gun. Okay, so watch this. How many people have died from guns last year? I don't versus, have the numbers. Versus semi-automatic weapon. I don't have the numbers. Okay, the numbers are astronomically big for guns versus semi-automatic weapons, okay? I'm a military guy, I'm an army guy, so I'm, I'm a pro-gun guy myself, so I'm not, that's not a position I'm taking. I just like guns, I have them, I collect them, I feel safer when I have kids. Somebody broke into my car one time and I said, babe, we're getting guns. And I the guy's probably addicted on drugs who broke in your he car. He may have been, I don't know, maybe he was poor. I don't want to judge what he did, but my concern is, you know how the concern on the uh, conservative Republican side is, they'll first come after semi-automatic weapons, then they're gonna go take your what? Guns, right? That's the fear. Okay, the bigger issue isn't semi-automatic weapons, it's guns. The bigger issue isn't marijuana, it's alcohol. Alcohol's killing way more people well, I'll, than I'll push you then. Do you think, we, do you think we should uh, ban alcohol? What, what, what my position isn't about banning alcohol. I, by the way, I can't stand alcohol. I cannot stand alcohol. People who work around me, they know how I feel about it. I'm not a fan of anything that controls me. Now, this is my opinion. Sure, so sure. Somebody would watch you saying, Pat smoked weed this morning. Yeah, so, but this, this, this is a good place for you to be. So you already know that alcohol causes problems. Yeah, but I'm also about teaching personal responsibility for you to be able to have the choice. But that you, you can't do that with an addict. Of course you can, but that addict's going to get what he wants illegally or illegally no, anyway. No, he won't. So here, here's all my what, friends got all their drugs illegally. Yeah. My friend got a couple hundred Vicodin pills from a doctor who was selling it to a kid he knew, and they were selling the pop pill, $5 a pop, and he was getting it from a dentist. So how are you going to get him off the drugs? What do you mean how are you going to get him How are you going to get an addict off drugs? What's your solution? To I, just I, ban... I, I, I've, I've got some. But what is but, your solution, though? But if, if yours is, let's just open everything. That's not my solution. What I'm saying to both of you guys, I'm, I'm challenging her to say, if you say legalize marijuana, what is it for the drug addict, drug dealer to say, screw it, I can't sell marijuana and make look, money, I'm going to go look. to cocaine. And she, her position is, fine, let's legalize everything because I'm comfortable if we do that with regulation. Did I pretty much paraphrase what you said? Sure. Uh, yes, uh, although my my focus is not on drugs as I a whole. I get that. No, I right? get that. It's, and and yeah. that, is, that is not a position of uh, normal. I don't want to put that on you saying with normal. That's your position. But I'm asking you, you, you use the word sin, which means you're probably a man of faith. Yes. Yes? Okay. So what is man-made? What is God-made? God-made is marijuana. God-made hemlock, then, if we want to go down that road. But what I'm or saying, heroin or cocaine or poppy, right? I get that, but if you go to man-made, you know, oh my gosh, you know, alcohol, all these other things that we can go out and say, we got to go sit there at the lab, but I can grow uh, marijuana in my backyard and smoke it and go through it, you know. Now, you know, so that's why I'm coming to you and asking, if that is your position, there are a lot of worse things that kill people than marijuana does. Well, certainly. I mean, you could talk about heroin and cocaine and methamphetamine, which we've tried to address. Look, drug usage used to go down in this country. We used to have really decent numbers 10 years ago. Okay. Now those numbers are coming back up. And there's no effort except talking about legalizing drugs. Look, some of the best work you can do when you come across an addict is A, in the mindset of a somebody else, just let them shoot up heroin on the street, right? And they're just gonna die a horrible death, contract diseases, share that disease. Or maybe you can get them off the streets. How do you get them off the streets? There's only one way to get an addict, and that's if they're committing a crime. But if drug usage is not a crime, then you can't get that addict off the streets. And one of the most effective treatment programs out there is called the Drug Court Program. Drug Court Program takes your low-level addicts and basically gives them a choice. They say, look, you can go to a, a real judge and potentially do real time for that crime, or because your crime was minor possession of a drug, you can go to a drug court judge. And in that drug court program, you're not incarcerated, but you come check in with that judge for about a year, you're, you get mandatory random drug tests, you gotta get a job, counseling, all these things. And I've been to countless graduations of drug court graduates who go to the judge, say, thank you, this is what I needed. Look, I was a California State Parole Board Commissioner, worked throughout our prison system, saw some of those violent murders sitting across the table from me. Never once I came across low-level offenders. 
But the research is clear that if you're not helping that addict on the streets with, with a hammer, a carrot and stick approach, they're gone. They're going to become part of your 6.8 million addicts who are going to end up dead. And how do you address that? that when, when, when real world hits this question, it changes everything on a dime. Real world is 5.5 million people have died from cigarettes. That's a real but that's number, a, Paul. That, that's a different debate. But, but yeah, that's why I ask man-made, God-made. That's a complete different debate. But if that's the position we're going to take, then let's go after, like, I would understand it. Like, if, let's just say you said, we're going after cigarettes. Okay, well, how are we going to go after cigarettes? Look at the amount of money they're making. We're going after cigarettes. We're going to make it hard for this big uh, uh, companies that are making the kind of money uh, that they're making with cigarettes. Let's go after them. I would understand that because you can show the data of 5.5 million people. There is not data on how many people marijuana is killed. And that, I hate to say this, it hurts the argument. Because you say data, so if I'm going to use data for areas that helps, on this area it doesn't you're, help the you're argument. You're mixing. The, the problem is you're mixing, you're mixing two different things here. Tobacco, I don't think I am. Tobacco though, is not an intoxicant. Marijuana is. There's a big, what we're talking about are intoxicants. P things that change people's behavior. Sure, but, okay, change people's behavior, fine. Yeah. If I eat cheesecake, it changes my behavior. I become happy. I'm talking about an, an intoxicant. I've, I'm, I'm okay with that, but, but cigarette kills people. But that's a different debate. So would you be for going and uh, in campaigning around, hey, we got to no. make uh, uh, cigarettes illegal? No. Why not? No, because I'm against intoxicants. Things that people so do. you're okay with cigarettes and alcohol? Well, am I okay with it? Look, I don't like okay it. Okay with availability to people. Two different things. Uh, we talk about intoxicant yeah. with alcohol. Tobacco, not an intoxicant. Alcohol on its own is a huge problem. And, and all of us around here should say, yeah, we've got enough problems with alcohol. Why open Pandora's box and add another substance on it when we already know alcohol is a big enough problem in society? Let that be the foundation for us to say, mm, don't want to go down that road with another substance. Hmm. We're not opening that box. Marijuana is already here. It's what is our public policy and how are we treating that? Are we going to continue to go down this road of arresting people for possession, ruining their lives with a criminal charge for possessing marijuana? Not, we're not talking about tra drug traffickers here, but people who, these 650,000 people who have marijuana possession charges now. That's, that's not preventing access. It's not preventing use. It's not helping addicts. It's simply charging people with possession and giving them a criminal record, often for the rest of their life. That is not a public policy that's working for America. Yeah, I, I, like I tell you for myself, I'm in the financial industry, so we have a broker dealer. And broker dealer is where you got to get licensed to sell stocks, bonds, mutual funds, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, all these other things. And in the broker dealer rules, they want to know if you've had a felony in the last 10 years. If you had it, no go. You can't submit your securities license. Or if you've had a misdemeanor the last five years, those are the two rules they're looking for, right, on what you've had. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, said when I was uh, running a uh, branch office manager myself saying, listen, I can't get your license. Why? Because you got for distribution of marijuana, I cannot do that for you, right? So it hurt a lot of people trying to get their careers going with their records. But le let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. History of marijuana. When did marijuana get illegal in the first place? Like, how did this happen? Prohibition began in the 30s. Um, prohibition of alcohol had ended, so that cash cow had kind of gone out to pasture. They needed something new to focus on, and marijuana became that focus. Uh, yellow journalism was used to spread reefer madness, and a few years later, marijuana starts to disappear from the doctor's bag, from the pharmacy shelves, where it was just a sort of everyday commonplace item in tinctures and different medical preparations. Uh, in 1970, Nixon ignores his own Schaefer report where it says marijuana should be decriminalized and instead uh, classifies marijuana as a dangerous Schedule One narcotic and we begin arresting our way through the drug war to where we are today. You think he did the right thing? Uh, we don't call it a drug war, it's a cancer, so we have a completely different outlook on this. Um, I, I'm always insulted when I hear that uh, we're in some sort of industry to make money in this law enforcement profession uh, off the backs of people that are selling dope. Uh, I, I'm, I'm shocked that we still hear that today. We have uh, men and women in uniform who are out there already doing an extremely dangerous job. Uh, we, we now are asking them to obviously patrol our streets and keep DUIs off the road. Now we're saying, and now let's also look for people who are driving 
high on the highways. And oh, by the way, um, the industry of legalization uh, that is going to come forward is going to tank your industry, so, so be it. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been insulted with that comment, and it is insulting uh, to hear that. So no, we don't exist as an agency to operate to take drug money to pay our salaries. That's like saying we have a quota to write 50 tickets so I can get a promotion. We gotta end that. We gotta end these 10 nonsense talking points that we consistently hear from the legalization side. Fed up with that. I'm sorry, you got another question? No, but I, I mean that part, uh, you know, to, to your point, uh, I've seen great parents, I've seen terrible parents. I've seen great Democrats, I've seen terrible Democrats. I've seen great Republicans, I've seen terrible Dem uh, Republicans. I've seen great cops, I've seen bad cops. But majority of cops out there are doing the right thing. Majority right. of cops out there are going out there putting their lives on the line. I've had friends who were, I almost became a cop and a firefighter, but I had 19 speeding tickets. You guys don't hire. If a person's got 19 speeding tickets, that doesn't qualify to be a cop, or else I would have been a cop. But the, 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 the part- 19? 19 yeah, that, that's a show in itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty good driver. You yeah, know, when yeah. it comes down to speed. I've had drivers two times in my career because my license was suspended two times yeah. in my career. But that's a whole different topic. But legalization of marijuana, okay? When I do a little bit of research on the history of it, you were kind of talking about in 1937, uh, the gentleman who was uh, leading the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, Harry and Sillinger, uh, and, uh, and he started kind of campaigning behind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to read what he said one time. He said one time, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S. This is in the 30s. And most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result for marijuana usage, this marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. At that time, that was a fear. At that time, there was a concern. At that time, it was, you know, like even, uh, uh, I'm Middle Eastern, I'm Iranian, okay? Born and raised in Iran, my mother's Armenian, my dad's Assyrian. They both wanted me to marry a uh, Middle Eastern, okay? So when I brought a white girl home, they were freaking out. So they said, wait a minute, who are you bringing home? She doesn't have our features. Who is this? Where is she from? I said, you know, is she Russian at least? No, she's from Texas. Why are you bringing a Texan home? I said, listen, this is who I want to marry. This is who I want to be my wife. But we have, we marry Middle Easterns, and I didn't. So, but that's the old tradition of Middle Easterns who were coming to America. They were uncomfortable with their own marrying somebody else. Maybe that was going on at that time. And then the bill was signed by FDR, who's a Democrat. And so on one end, FDR signs the bill, and he approves it, and that gets kicked in. And then later on, Nixon comes and says, hey, we need to make this what it is. But for 5,000 years or whatever timeline you want to put it, marijuana was legal. So did it happen because of propaganda or did it happen for the right reasons? Did it happen to use a way to control a community? Did it happen to kind of, you know, control the populace, the typical way that happens? I don't know if we, <clears throat> for a fact, are going to know the exact motivation behind it. He's not here for us to ask him the questions. Says, I mean, you, you can listen to the tapes from Nixon. I know from Nixon, but I don't know from him. Right. And he started it, and FDR signed it. You know, before, before he made that statement, you can look a few years prior, and he absolutely said that marijuana was not a priority for him. But he changed his tune. So back then, marijuana was, what, 1% to 3% tetrahydrocannabinol? I don't I think mean, we were testing dry weight measurements back then. But, but basically, it was ditchweed. Sure. And now it's hydroponics, soil. I mean, it is an industry of lighthouses that are coming in to make this stuff. It's not the same marijuana of 20 years ago. I mean, we are dealing with extremely potent. You don't even, shouldn't even call it marijuana. I mean, you see the dabs, the honey oil. We still call it cannabis. It's not. I mean, look at what folks are using. That is not the Cheech and Chong stuff that even I was smoking 30 plus years ago. It's a completely different, different drug. It may be a different drug. It may be a different animal. It's still the same drug. Maybe, no, it's it not the same drug. Tetrahydrocannabinol is tetrahydrocannabinol, whether it's concentrated or it's not. It's still the same drug, literally. It is tetrahydrocannabinol. We can and compare it people, to prohibition, if you, if you will. Sure, but let's talk about THC and how but THC is still THC. It, and sure, it might have been in lower concentrations back then, and now it's in higher concentrations. When people consume THC, they tend to titrate their dose uh, automatically. They're not, if you have a, a marijuana cigarette that has... 2% THC, maybe the person smokes the whole thing. And the person, the same person has a marijuana cigarette that has 20% THC, they're not going to automatically smoke the entire thing. They're gonna smoke as much as they need to get whatever sensation they're after, whether it's pain relief or intoxication because they're not at work anymore. 
who knows? But uh, that's generally how marijuana is consumed. It's not consumed at the same amount regardless of what the concentration of THC is. People titrate their dosing. It also lacks a physical component for addiction. You, might, you can personally believe that marijuana is addicting, but there is no physical component that makes marijuana addicting. It is addicting the way anything else generally in society is addicting. Your cell phone, cheesecake, as you mentioned, those things I, could I certainly be addicting to a person. I, I think it's but dangerous. But marijuana does not clinically have a physical mechanism like opioids do where you have a physical addiction. I think that's, that's a very dangerous comment to make. It's um, not a dangerous I, comment, I, I it's, would, it's clinical I, fact. I, I, look, I, have you been to a Marijuana Anonymous meeting? I, I don't have a, a marijuana addiction I'm, or I'm not marijuana saying, I'm not use saying problem, you have to, so I, but, I don't but know why you're so, to an addict's because meeting. Because you're so engaged in this, I would encourage you to look, just Google Marijuana Anonymous. They're okay. all over the country and just go sit in one and listen to the people talk about their addictions. Mm -hmm. I think that will change your mind. I think it's great that people who have addictions, who struggle with addiction for whatever reason, who don't have access to adequate or have not had access to adequate health care in the past, have a place to, to, to get help. Um, and, and that is not, that, that is, the need for access to health care is certainly important. But one's lack of access to health care does, does not build the need to arrest people for possession. But we're not, and we already have medical we marijuana. We absolutely are no, arresting people for possession. Listen. Uh, arrests uh, increased stats. in my state 3.5% this year. Okay. They arrest 20%, they increased 20% the year before. Virginia, all day long, is increasing marijuana arrests, simple possession arrests, year after year after year. What percentage of those are, are in your prison? Have you looked at the real numbers? And have you, more importantly, looked at those cases that are pled down? The, how this works in the real world is you get arrested and mm -hmm. you get pled down. The, sure. the, the problem that your research is not being truthful about is telling the public that most of these cases are much higher and they get pled down. Most cases do get pled down. Again, I don't uh, disagree with that, and I'm not, okay, well, I'm well, not I'm the one who's saying that. that millions of people are in jail for simple marijuana well, I'm possession. Glad to hear that. They are not. Thank you. Hundreds of thousands of people are arrested, arrested for possession. So shouldn't arrested. we? So shouldn't we say this? Why don't we work together on getting people to stop smoking pot? Wouldn't that be a more advantageous? No, I piece think that we don't have the ability to control Americans so like that. Americans can make these decisions for themselves. But you can if, say that about cocaine and heroin. Then, sure, we can say that dangerous. about anything because it's America, and people are able to make their own decisions for themselves. What are the public policies that we're going to put in place around these issues, and how are they going to provide for public safety and for consumer safety? We don't have that policy in the majority of U.S. states it doesn't for work adult use of marijuana. already in your states of California, Colorado, Oregon, I, and Washington. I disagree with that. I think go that watch, go, go. I certainly disagree with that. I think there are people who live you in have, San Francisco and Seattle and Los Angeles right now that are super happy with how their cities are. No, I think they are beautiful not. Places you to actually visit. have people in San Francisco, the mayor and others, saying, we don't know what to do. We've got a crisis on our streets. They have more homeless than kids in their public schools. That's a disgrace. Those and are, you want to hang that on marijuana? That's marijuana's fault? It, it's addiction. But we're not here to talk about addiction. We're talking about marijuana. Of course we are, because marijuana is an addictive substance. It's not an addictive substance. It's something that people can be addicted to, just like their phone or cheesecake or well, picking their look, nose. But it is not an addictive it's the same, substance. It's the same thing. It is addiction. We Look. I don't disagree that we have an addiction problem in America. I, I'm glad to hear that from you. But marijuana is is not the, the root cause of the addiction crisis in America, and then often it's not. It's not the root it is, cause. It is a solution. It, it is, is a an cause. option. I will agree with it you. Is. It is. It's not the cause to all addiction, but it is a cause, which is all I want to open your door to. It is. It is a cause. Which I will show agree with you in this, and, and that marijuana prohibition is absolutely an impetus in the addiction crisis. Because when someone goes to buy illegal marijuana, that drug dealer offers them other drugs. When you go to a regulated store, when you go to a dispensary that sells only marijuana, you're gonna get your ID checked and you're gonna be sold marijuana products that are labeled in and lab tested. The black market right now. I don't think that 90% of the pot in California have is you seen how much from the, have the Have you seen how much market. the taxes are? that they're doing. I, I, I absolutely why, agree why with you any, on that. Why would that any smart if you pothead price here, if pay you, twice as much for a dime bag I at don't a store disagree with you with that at all. And I don't think Colorado has the right regulatory model for adult use marijuana. I but don't this think is what California you advocated for. This is what you this sold is, to the public. 
as would a better work. public policy than arresting people? Absolutely. A public policy that uh, that then overtaxes a product and drives people back to the illicit market? Your no, idea, that's no, not a great no. idea. The, the views of normal have increased drug addicts, increased people driving high on our highways, and have increased the black market into these states. They have done the complete opposite of what they told the voters legalization would have so, been. So normal did not implement a regulatory structure. Normal advocates for the end of prohibition. Whatever California adopted for their regulatory model for marijuana, is on California. Do you, do you have an organization in California, Normal California? Uh, California Normal is there. And were you active in Prop 2000, in, in 2016 initiative to legalize I marijuana? I believe that California Normal did in fact Absolutely support the initiative did. to legalize marijuana. So you marijuana. own responsibility. That is not the same as the regulatory structure it that doesn't it matter. has increased it's tax you, revenue. It's what you told the voters. The voters were told a and lie. And the voters agree. The voters, I don't think the voters were sold a lie. I think the voters decided that they wanted to legalize marijuana just like they decided in 1996 that they wanted to legalize medical marijuana. Well, we live in two different universes of the reality. I would encourage you. Look, you're a nice lady. And I really look at you as somebody who wants to do the right thing. And I would just encourage you to get out of the theory of the books and just go visit. Go walk around to LA, San Francisco, you got more pot stores than Starbucks. You've got kids out there on skateboards rolling around high. You've got the dropout rates. You've got the unemployment rates. You've got the homeless shelters that are sometimes miles long along the 91 freeway. Most of those people are using drugs. They're not out there just you know, throwing chalk against the wall. There's an addiction crisis. It's not a homeless crisis in America. We have an addiction crisis in America. And that's what's perpetuating this problem in all these cities that we're seeing. And so if we can give people a safer alternative to the hard substances that are going to kill them, like you said, no, heroin? That's, that's, that, that's a false choice. Let's, let's help people not use drugs in the first place. I don't think that that's the solution for everyone. I don't think that you're not, you get no drug, period, that's it, go on with your life. I don't think that's a solution for everyone. Of course not. We have 340 million people in this country. People are going to use drugs. So we can't, we're never going to eliminate the problem. We're never going to eliminate homelessness off the streets of any city. But that doesn't mean you give up and go, we lost the war on homelessness. You want to do everything you can to mitigate absolutely. and minimize absolutely. that problem and those statistics. You absolutely do want to do that everything you can to for minimize is doing the exact and mitigate. Opposite. I, I completely disagree with that. We can look at states that have 25% reduction in opioid overdose that is a, fatalities. That, that is not true. Those are it is absolutely no, it is true. Not. It well, is okay. absolutely true. Well, maybe we states can get some hyperlinks on the YouTube laws. video of the current research that people can click right and read. Right out there. On that. If, so by the way, if both of you guys can send your links, we'll put the Absolutely. links, Jen's links, and we'll put Paul's links so everybody Thank can you. go <clears throat> and any documentary you want us to watch, let us know you Thank as you. well. Yeah. Uh, we'll and, put and look, it below. That's the right <coughs> approach because we've got to look at your viewers here. They're hearing, you know, a lot of them don't have the in-depth. But, but this is how you learn though. Yeah, this that's is right. exactly that's how you right. learn. Absolutely. The, the one part I do want to uh, uh, want you to elaborate on, you said 90% of the marijuana is being sold in California legally versus 10% because of taxes. C can you elaborate on that? What, what do you mean yeah. by taxes? So in the, the argument to legalizing drugs in California to the voters, they couldn't outright say, <coughs> let's just legalize pot. They had to create a name for it, like safe streets, safe this, money for schools. We're going to tax the marijuana sales. That way, government gets money and we can fund all these different programs. Well, it's not rocket science that when you create another bureaucracy and a tax on top of that, you're going to increase the cost of that product. The black market doesn't have taxes, regulatory market. They just come right in and go, hey, you want to buy a dime bag for that much at that store with a nice green cross in the window, or you want to buy it for this much? How big of a difference is the price point? It really depends. I mean, you look at, and what's happening now is... Is it a, is it a legitimate number? Oh, it, it's, it's, it's a legitimate number because, because the stats. But here's what's important is, in states like Washington or Oregon or other places that have legalized and it's been around for quite some time, the, the legal cost now of marijuana, because there's so much of it, is, is plummeting. And so what's happening, they're taking that marijuana and they're not following the law. They're now trafficking that to other states across the country where it's illegal. It happens all the time here in Texas. The marijuana in, in Texas is from Colorado and California. There's a huge market for it, and they get to hide under the umbrella of legalization. So as a consumer, I will save money if I buy it from a dealer, drug dealer, than if I would from buying it from a Absolutely. legal medicine? Absolutely. What do you think about that? You might make that choice, but if you go to a dispensary, they're going to ask for your ID. They're not going to ask for your entire wallet and your jewelry and your phone. 
Uh, when you Which, just what like, does that mean? they're not going to rob you. Oh, you're saying if they <laughs> when rob you go you. to a clean, well lit environment, a dealer's going to sell you a bag of weed, right? It's going to be weed. Who knows what else is in there? At a dispensary, it's going to be labeled and lab tested. I mean, I, I've been around drug dealers. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in LA. Uh, I'm from a divorced kid. I, I was I was around them all the time. You know, I, I mean, that's also an assumption with with. Uh, <clears throat> with drug dealers, assuming they're going to be doing that. But if I know I'm going to save money on here, we all know a lot of Americans find ways to save money on taxes. Mm -hmm. This will be another loophole. For me is, if you're making the argument and it's going to eliminate criminals, well, then that's something to get behind. But if And, and drug dealers. Because I got three kids. I got a seven, five, and a three. So this is something that I'm connected to right now as a 40-year-old versus me at 22. It's a different mindset. But if it's not going to, then there's still the option if 90% is still being bought illegally, that's a big number, Jen. You know, I, I, I'd really like to see those numbers. I would like to see it as well, by the way. If you do, you yeah. actually have data that Absolutely. shows that. Absolutely. I would love to, it, let's just say that is true. Yeah. Say it is true, Jen. Let's sure. just assume here it is once we get the data. And by the way, if you send the data early, we'll even put the screenshot here so people can see it. Let's just say it is true that 90% is being sold illegally. That, that doesn't validate the concern of eliminating you know, criminals, because they'll still be active on the streets selling. So how do we address that? So I think what's important and what, what Paul is bringing mm -hmm. up is the inflated tax rate that not only the state can put on marijuana, but that localities can put on marijuana mm -hmm. as well. And that is, this is certainly an industry issue, and that is not what normal is. Normal is not an industry organization. Uh, and that's something that, that industry and regulatory agencies need to address. And you cannot tax consumers out of your market space, and you cannot overtax them because, as Paul clearly noted, they will go buy marijuana from the guy they used to buy it from before because it's cheaper. Uh, that, that might hold true in an, in an adult use model. I certainly think that there are a number of medical patients out there who by no means can go purchase marijuana from a, a dealer and, and be satisfied with that. It's not going to address the needs that they have. It might be uh, contaminated or dangerous or not be in the right format that they need it. Um, but you, you, can't, you can't price consumers out of the marketplace. You can't um, cr create or implement a regulatory model that doesn't address the initial objectives of reducing crime, of pr providing safe access, and, and reducing illicit market. Doesn't this kind of become, you know, big tobacco 2.0 though? It, it, we live in America. This is a capitalist society, That's right. and marijuana is not special. Marijuana will be commodified just like anything else is. Right. Uh, one day we should all be so fortunate as to have the labor of choosing between Marlboro Greens uh, at the you know convenience store and craft cannabis at the boutique dispensary and pharmaceuticalized cannabinoids at CVS. That is absolutely what will happen in the future once federal prohibition is ended and, and marijuana will fit into all of these other segments of our capitalist society. Jen, just out of curiosity for the viewer, do you regularly consume marijuana, THC? Do you regularly take anything yourself or no? Absolutely not. I live in Virginia. So you don't at all? No. So the last time you used anything, when was it? I, I have been to legal states before, but it is, it is just not a part of my life. By the way, that's, that's very interesting, to, 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 just so you know that. I am so glad you said that because the viewer is now confused, okay? Because the viewer is saying, a lot of times somebody that's so pro Ford is because they're using it on a weekly basis or a daily basis, so mm -hmm. that's your argument. This is phenomenal uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, knowing that you're not somebody that's regularly using this. Uh, what are your thoughts on Tobacco 2.0? You think this could lead to a Tobacco 2.0 thing? It's, type it's of thing? already here. It's big, big tobacco. Yeah. So it's already here. It's, Billionaires it's are popping out left and right. Everywhere. With look, yeah. look if, I, if, I had, if I had no morals, no values, and I just wanted to make money, I would go to the marijuana movement right now. I, I absolutely would. So you think anybody that's making money on that side doesn't have morals and absolutely values? Absolutely. No morals, really no values. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. From, from, uh, from uh, the former uh, Speaker of, of the House, uh, John Boehner. Absolutely. And I'm a conservative. These, so this, these guys are coward sellouts. If we're conservatives and they go to that industry, cowards and sellouts. Oof, Absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's a strong statement right there. Yes. Because if you're saying that, are, are the founders of Budweiser, Miller Lite, are, are all those guys, 
you know, are they also cowards? And well, you're, look, we're talking. I know, a, a, but apples, I'm asking. Apples but, and oranges. But I'm, so I'm, I'm asking. I'll you, stick to the let, current. But if I was asking, you, let's talk oranges. Are they also criminals? Are they also for getting all these people? To, you know, 5.5 million cigarette. You know, more, are these guys also criminals? For, uh, I'm going to talk about you know marijuana, the illegal drugs, the intoxicants. I get here, that, look, Paul. Look, but look, I, I asked that question, and and and, and, I, and I appreciate you saying that, but. That's a very strong statement you made right there. And I'll say, and I'll say it even more so. Um, once Boehner stepped out of office, you yeah. know where he went? You know how much money he's making a year right now for the marijuana industry? $10 million a year as an advocate lobbying Congress. And, and just so everybody knows, Boehner is a Republican. Yes. So you're not, he's not taking sides on uh, Democrats or Republicans. You're being very fair by he saying was, that. He was against it when he was in, got out, saw an opportunity to make $10 million. And look, I, I, first off, I, I don't, I'm not getting paid to be here. I'm a volunteer, sure. right? You're probably a staff, right, with normal, so you get paid. Um, I have no skin in this game, right? I'm here because I've seen both sides of this. And I have no problem calling out my own party our, our, who are cowardly doing the wrong thing. If we, as conservatives, are gonna talk about the, the moral standards of this, and it's much different than a lot of other arguments that we must call out our own. The problem is normal is winning because they are desensitizing America. Their goal is to get to 25 states plus with legalization. Once you cross that threshold, it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. So we're in a battle right now, I think, that is very, very important. And when you bring up big tobacco, yeah, that's exactly what this is. Here's the crazy thing, in California, you can't smoke cigarettes publicly in a lot of places, but now you can smoke pot. They've got a West Hollywood restaurant that just announced they're gonna open up, and the city unanimously allowed the business to have an open air smoking pot, but you can't smoke cigarettes. The hypocrisy on this is just asinine. Final thoughts on both ends. Jen, let's start off with you. What are, what are your final thoughts? Uh, listen, marijuana prohibition isn't working. It's not preventing access for kids. It's not providing for public or consumer safety. It's not a policy that Americans by and large support and you know, the sooner that we take marijuana off the street corner and put it behind an age verified counter, that's where we can achieve all of these goals of, of protecting the kids and, and providing for public and consumer safety. Paul. It's already playing out before us as Americans. Anybody who has any inkling about which way this is going, you know, go visit any of the cities we mentioned. Go visit San Francisco. You can actually YouTube videos of NBC, ABC, CBS, other news crews there watching school kids step over people passed out, stepping over needles, stepping over human poop. If the ideology of this open society, anything goes, starting off with marijuana, that's what the rest of America is gonna look like. You have middle class families leaving all these cities, coming other places like Texas, South Carolina, Tennessee. You and I have got young kids. I've got a 10, 9, 8, and 6 year old. To me, it's about the future of the country that they are gonna have. And you gotta ask yourself a very simple question. Are we better off legalizing more drugs or are we better off preventing it in the first place and not going down the slippery slope? And you don't have to take theory anymore as the argument. Just go visit what's happening in America. So uh, first of all, appreciate both of you guys for coming out, you know, really, because and especially being friendly and yet at the same time pushing each other. Uh, I learned a lot from listening to both of you guys as far as arguments goes. I hope the view viewers did as well. Just so everybody knows in full disclosure, neither party got paid from us to be here. This is they chose to come here because they believe in what they're talking about. We're going to leave everyone's handle. Jen's handle is going to be here. Paul's going to be here, Twitter handle. And mine's, mine's going to be here. Whatever your biggest takeaway, agreement, disagreement is, you can go on Twitter and tweet all of us and let us know your thoughts. You can also comment below on what you took away from today's episode. And last but not least, all the links that they talked about, they sent to us. We put Jen's links below and we put Paul's links below. You can go through all of that to find out more about uh, the sources that they have. So having said that, thanks again for coming out. Appreciate your time. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank thanks, you. Patrick.